Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to my show, Stolen Lives. I'm your host, Ms. Doe. And today it's my second video. My previous video was about Agatha Christie. And in that video, I was too scared to lose the sunlight. So I don't have any makeup on or I don't have any jewelry or stuff. I, I look like myself. I look like myself. I love myself. Uh, but for this one, I just, you know, done some makeup and, um, yeah, yeah, just, just like that. But I still don't have any foundation on because I'm still too scared to lose the sunlight. And it's already evening and probably the sun will be gone before we finish shooting this video because this video will be so so long like um it is four thousand words and it will be probably like an hour or something like this i'm not sure i hope i won't have to do this video as two parts because i really hate doing uh separate videos well, um, today we are here to remember a little girl named Elsie Peruback. She was murdered, but unfortunately, even after more than 110 years later, we still don't have the answers we need. Sounds interesting to you? Then let's start. Well, the story of the kidnapping and murder of a young girl named Elsie Prubeck in the spring of 1911 is almost a forgotten tale in the annals of Chicago crime. Few but the most dedicated historians remember much about the case today, but at the time her disappearance and the subsequent search for her involved law enforcement officials from three states and galvanized the people of Chicago. Nearly everyone was transfixed by the newspaper articles dedicated to the story. A story that did not have a happy ending. To this day, the murder of Elsie Perubeck has never been solved. Eliska Elsie Perubeck's mother was born Karolina Vucacek in November 1869 in Michal, East Bohemia, in what is now the Czech Republic. Elsie's father, Frantisek Frank Perubak, was born in Bohemia in 1867. At the age of 15, he came to the United States but later returned to Bohemia for a 10 year span between 1882 and 1892. He and Carolina were married in Bohemia in 1892 and returned to America. Frank worked as a painter while Carolina took care of their home and raised a large brood of children. Eliska, Elsie, was their seventh child. She was a happy child with light golden hair, blue eyes, and a ready smile. On the morning of April the 8th, 1911, five-year-old Elsie left her home at 2320 South Albany Avenue in Chicago, Illinois, telling her mother that she was going to visit Auntie who was Mrs. Frank Trampoda, who lived around the corner at 2325 South Troy Street. Turning left on the 22nd Street, then left again on Troy, she met her nine-year-old cousin, Josie Trampoda, and a number of other children who were listening to an organ grinder on the streets. When the organ grinder moved on to the corner of the 23rd Street, the children followed him past Mrs. Trampoda's gate, except for Elsie, who stayed behind. 
At that point, no one realized that she was missing. Several hours later, Elsie's mother followed her daughter to the Champota house. When she arrived at her sister's, Carolina learned that Elsie had never arrived. Because the little girl had many friends in the neighborhood, the woman assumed that she must be visiting at another home, perhaps even spending the night and returning in the morning. At 9 p.m. that evening, Frank Peruba came home from work and learned about Elsie's absence. He was not as unconcerned as his wife and sister-in-law and went immediately to the Hinman Street Police Station to report her missing. Initially, the police agreed that it was likely she was staying with friends, but when Elsie had not returned home the next morning, Captain John Mahoney took personal charge of the search for the missing girl. Before we continue, I'd like to make some comments about the situation. You know, and I, I know it's 1911 and um, in the past, you know, there were not as many kidnappings and child murders as right now, but it was still like, you have a little girl, you are the mother of a little girl who is absent and you are just saying, oh, probably she's at somebody's house and staying the night and she will come back tomorrow. Oh, it's okay. Like, I'm not a mother. I don't have kids, but like I have sisters, I have cousins and I would never say things like this. I would, I would be anxious about this because uh, I, I don't even know how to explain this but I feel like you understand me like is it how being a good mother looks like I, I don't think so and also the aunt like Mrs. Trampuda like both women were a little bit dumb I guess and I feel like maybe if they took action before maybe Elsie would be alive. I don't know, I don't know, but I just feel like they didn't do everything they could. So it just makes me sad knowing that Elsie's mother and aunt were uh, unresponsible people. Yeah, but I, I am also grateful that Frank Perubak, the father of Elsie, took action as soon as he learned about his daughter's absence because that's, in my case, how being a good father looks like. And now we can keep going. Detectives from several stations canvassed the neighborhood and suspects soon emerged. A boy named John Jarowski told detectives from the Maxwell Street Station, led by Inspector Stephen K. Healy, that he had seen a gypsy wagon identified as Romani people in some accounts on Catsey Avenue, a block west of Troy Street. There were two women on the wagon and one of them was holding a little girl. The police knew of several gypsy camps along the Des Plaines River near Katsy and went down to speak with the residents. They told investigators that one wagon had decamped and left on the morning of April the 9th. While the idea of being stolen by gypsies sounds far-fetched today, the theory was plausible at the time because Elsie's disappearance was almost identical to that of a girl named Lillian Wolf who had been found with gypsies four years earlier. I don't know the story of Lillian Wolf. I don't know if you do, but if you know, then you can just, you know, enlighten me about her story. Or if you'd like to, I can do my research and make a video about her. It's, it's up to you. Meanwhile, Frank Perubak had offered his life savings of $50 about $1,165 today as a reward for the girl's return. 
Detectives from Maxwell Street searched the Italian neighborhoods around West 14th and South Halstead Streets, where it was reported that a girl fitting Elsie's description had been seen with an organ grinder. Inspector Healy ordered that the drainage canals be dragged for the child's body on April the 12th and again on April the 15th. And Illinois Governor Dan Estenin asked the public to assist with the search. Soon there were thousands of people on the lookout for the little girl, but she was nowhere to be found. Frank Perubak, accompanied by detectives Comrose and Sheehan, went in search of the departed gypsy wagon, which was originally believed to be headed for Round Lake, Illinois, a small town about 15 miles northwest of Chicago. There were about seven wagons in camp there at the time, and local farmers were alerted to be on the watch for Elsie. Unfortunately, many of them took it upon themselves to question the gypsies, gypsies and attempt to search their wagons. In the middle of the night, they broke camp, now headed for Wolo, Illinois. Wolo residents reported a child matching Gilly's Elsie's who is Ellie? Elsie's description with the gypsies, adding that she appeared to be stupefied or drugged and partly covered with a blanket. They also attempted to search the wagons, but the gypsies again ex escaped and departed for McHenry, Illinois, about 60 miles from Chicago. When the police finally caught up with them at McHenry, they discovered the little girl as a gypsy and did not match Elsie at all, other than they were about the same size and age. <sighs> According to the police, the gypsies often kidnap small children because of the natural law of the wandering people for blue-eyed, yellow-haired children. The Chicago Daily News consistently described Elsie as small, having long curly golden hair, blue eyes and pink chubby cheeks, with a prominent dimple in each. At the time she disappeared, she wore a red hat, a red dress, black stockings and high top black boots. The entire city was on the lookout for the girl. On April the 17th, police captain Mahoney received an anonymous telephone call saying that a child of Elsie's description had been seen with a man at a hotel in Western Springs, Illinois. Again, detectives dispatched to the hotel found nothing. In Sycamore, Illinois, the local police chief accompanied Frank Perubak when he investigated several gypsy wagons that I guess my phone only lets me shoot a video for like five minutes or something. Well, well, I will read the paragraph from the beginning again. <sighs> the entire city was on the lookout for the girl. On April the 17th, Police Captain Mahoney received an anonymous telephone call saying that a child of Elsie's description had been seen with a man at a hotel in Western Springs, Illinois. Again, detectives dispatched to the hotel found nothing. In Sycamore, Illinois, the local police chief accompanied, accompanied Frank Perubak when he investigated several gypsy wagons at Cherry Wally, but they found no children resembling Elsie. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Hinman Street police officers fielded reporters' questions about a $500 ransom note received by Carolina. They denied official knowledge of the communication, but admitted it might be true. Nothing ever came of the alleged ransom note. In the second week after Elsie's disappearance, Lillian Wolf, now age 11, came to the police to offer her assistance. She had been the subject of an identical manhunt four years earlier when she had been stolen by gypsies and forced to work for six days as a beggar. 
She was recovered after being spotted by a farmer as she was walking behind a gypsy wagon outside Moments, Illinois. Lillian provided what details she could about the typical behavior of the gypsies and offered to lead a rescue party if Elsie was found. One of the men who had kidnapped Lillian was tracked down in prison and suggested that the police contact Elijah George, the king of the gypsies, for help. George was found in Argyle, Wisconsin and brought to Joliet but failed to give the desired information and was released. At this point, Inspector Healy again ordered the drainage canal dragged, along with the search of wells, cisterns, and other places into which Elsie might have fallen. By April the 30th, Elsie had been missing for three weeks, and the city was in an uproar. The superintendent of schools, Mrs. Ella Flagg Young, requested that all of the school children in the Chicago area organize neighborhood searchers during their spring break. Around the same time, Frank Prubach, out of desperation, consulted the psychic medium who said that Elson was Elson. That should be Elsie, right? Elsie was in Argo, Wisconsin. Chicago politician Charles J. Wapika sent officers to the area that she indicated, but there was no sign of the girl. The search went from Illinois to Wisconsin, from Wisconsin to Minnesota, and then back again to Illinois, but with no luck. In the midst of the investigation, something sinister was going on. A few days after Elsie had vanished, Frank Perubak began receiving anonymous letters from an unknown source. The letters, described as insulting, were all written in English, which he could not read. He asked neighbors to translate. The letters claimed that Elsie had been taken by someone who hated the Perubaks and accused the family of mistreating her. Frank was so angry about the accusations that he burned the letters. Regardless, detectives attempted to follow up on the leads. The Czech community in Chicago relied to rely to support the family. All Czech-speaking policemen were put into plain clothes and assigned to the investigation. The women's auxiliary of the club Bohemia also helped with the search, creating what they called an endless chain letter which was mailed to every party of the city, asking that recipients mail copies to everyone they knew. Various Czech American politicians became involved, and the Bohemian Charitable Association offered a $500 reward. Other reward offers poured in. Governor Denise, well, I am not angry at all. Governor Dineen asked the legislature to revise the statute so that a reward could be offered by the state of Illinois. At that time, state laws did not allow the offering of a reward for the, for the apprehension of kidnappers as a death for murderers. Mayor Harder, Carter Harrison Jr. contributed $25, $600 in today's money to a personal reward fund that was set up. Anton Sermak, then a Chicago alderman, stated that if Elsie was not found by the next city council meeting on May 1st, he would call upon the city council to offer an even larger reward. The police were overwhelmed with calls. Every time a girl in a red dress was sighted in a gypsy camp, the tip was called into the police. By May the 1st, though, investigators had all but abandoned the idea that Elsie had been stolen by gypsies and returned to their efforts of searching wells and dragging rivers and canals. Judge Joseph Sabbath objected to what he said was a lackluster search. He claimed that the police hunt was becoming listless because Elsie's parents were poor. He had been receiving contributions to the reward fund from all over the country and increased his own contribution to $100.
Meanwhile, detectives Zahur and Zlasky were still searching for the writer of the letters that had been sent to the Peru vets. They believed that the men lived near Madison and Ruby streets and that he knew more about the disappearance than he was saying. Lieutenant Costello, supported by Inspector Healy, flatly declared, Elsie Perubak fell into the drainage canal from the Katsi Avenue bridge or near it. She was not murdered. They believed the author of the letters witnessed her fall. Their search turned up no trace of him, however. The search of the gypsy camp continued. By May the 7th, 25 camps had been searched and several false leads had turned up nothing. Police Captain Mahoney suddenly announced his belief that Elsie was dead, but vowed that the police would continue to search for her body. The search didn't last much longer. Two days later, an electrical engineer named George T. Scully, along with other employees of the Lockport Power Plant near Joliet, discovered a body floating in the drainage canal. At first, they thought it was an animal from one of the nearby farms, but three hours later, realizing that it looked like a child, they sent out a boat to bring it to shore. Undertaker William Goodale, who was called to examine the body, said that it appeared to fit the description of Elsie Perubak. The description tallied to the shade of the hair, the texture of the stockings and the stuff and tint of the dress of little Elsie. He stated that he believed the body had been in the water for several weeks. It was badly decomposed and originally reports said there were no marks of violence on the body. Goodale notified Chicago authorities who sent police lieutenant Costello to the Peru back home. When she saw the green-faced policeman on her Doorstep, hat in hand, Curly, Carolina, Peruba cried out, My dear child, and she begged to be told Elsie was alive. <sighs> Frank was taken to the Goodale funeral home at midnight. He said, Clothes look like Elsie's, but the face, I can't recognize it. Her mother alone can tell. I'm not crying, you are. <laughs> the next morning, Carolina was brought to the Lockport Undertaker's parlor by a trolley car, and she positively identified the dead girl as her daughter. She was courted. <laughs> it's you. My darling, thank God we've found you and you're not in the hands of the gypsies. For the next hour, she paced back and forth or sat nervously with her husband in an adjoining room. Frank held her hands and they wept and prayed to Goodale, who had followed the investigation into the girl's disappearance in the newspapers, made a statement to the police. The body appears to have been in the water for about a month which would tell you with the date of Elsie Perubeck's disappearance. The child, when she left home, was without hat and her clothing tillies in every respect with that found on the dead body. There was no ring or other ornament, and in that respect, the descriptions correspond, excepting only as to the color of the eyes, which cannot be clearly observed as the, as the color. The descriptions are identical. Arrangements were made for an inquest with Coroner William Wunderlich of Will County President. Frank Peruback was called as the first witness. Disregarding questions asked of him by the coroner, Peruback insisted that his daughter had been murdered. Through a translator, he told the jury, I am sure the gypsies stole my girl and then when they knew we were after them, they killed her and threw her body into the canal. At this assertion, chaos broke out in the jury room. Carolina began screaming and ran from the funeral parlor where the inquest was being held, shooting my Elsie is that she was murdered, murdered. Her husband and Detective Zaleski tried to calm her down, but in her extreme distress, she started running up and down the street, 
driving a crowd of curious onlookers. She insisted that she had known for three weeks that gypsies had killed Elsie and that the police had done nothing about it. Frank eventually was able to calm her down and assisted her in boarding a trolley car for home. The results of the inquest were inconclusive. Coroner Wanderlid stated, This case has attracted such attention that a minute examination will be made. We will be content with no perfunctory inquest such as this. The jury will refuse to state, state its convictions, for it has none, until after the autopsy has been held. We want to stomach out the little girl examined and the lungs as well. The father charges murder. It is certainly possible that he is right. During the autopsy, two physicians, E.A. Kingston and W.R. Paddock, confirmed that Elsie had not drowned. There was no water in her lungs. Kingston said that she had been attacked, a euphemism for rape, and murdered before her body was placed in the water. Paddock said that there was evidence that she had been wounded before she was killed. Lieutenant Costello later told the press that she had been mistreated, which seemed to indicate that her death had not been the work of gypsies. They also found deep cuts on the left side of her face. Although these doctors reported blue marks on the throat as though the victim had been choked. Another examination by Dr. E.R. LeCount and Dr. Warren H. Hunter, Hunter of the coroner's office revealed that Elsie had been suffocated, not strangled. The official cause of death was listed, listed as unknown. Coroner Peter Hoffman agreed with Frank Brubeck as to the probably circumstances of Elsie's death. The little girl had been murdered, he believed. Coroner Hoffman announced, It is our belief that the abductor of the child suffocated her to death, possibly by putting a hand over her mouth. The coroner's report recommended that officials continue to investigate. Inspector Healy immediately detailed detectives on a case that had changed from a missing girl to a murdered one. He told reporters, we have one or two theories, but nothing specific enough to talk about. I intend to place more men on the case tomorrow. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Costello returned to investigating the anonymous letters that were sent to the Prebacks, believing them to be the key to solving the case. On the evening of May the 9th, Carolina was considerably calmer and gave an interview to reporters at her home. Surrounded by friends and neighbors, she told them, Before the doctors found that Elsie's lungs were free from water and scoured reasons for believing she had been- I don't know why is this happening to my phone. I I'm really sorry. So, I'm, I'm, I'm starting from Carolina's words. Before the doctors found that Elsie's lungs were free from water and discovered reasons for believing she had been strangled, I knew she had been murdered. A picture of the crime has been in my mind since the second week of her disappearance, and I am convinced that when the truth is known, as it surely will be, it will be shown that she was choked to death a week from April the 8th when she was kidnapped on her way to visit her auntie. Carolina urged the police to find and punish the killers. Unfortunately, the poor family had other matters to deal with, Elsie's funeral, which they could not afford. Carolina told Judge Sabat that the search had exhausted all of the money the family had and there was nothing left to bury her with. The judge gave her a check for $25 and promised to raise more funds. Friends and family members pitched in and gave money and also raised more money for the reward fund. Mrs. Sophie Johans raised over $50 by giving a benefit party and soliciting donations from Bohemians on the West Coast. Elsie's funeral was held on 
May the 12th, on the front lawn of the Peru back home. Hours before it was scheduled to begin, mourners and onlookers began to gather, numbering almost 3,000. They crowded into the yard, around the house, along balconies, and on porches of nearby homes. There was no hall in the neighborhood large enough to haul them all. The Perubacks had been offered the use of a union hall, but Frank knew there were just too many people and he didn't want to turn anyone away. He said, they have come to say goodbye to my Elsie. Don't let them be disappointed. Reserve police officers from the Hinman Street Station were tasked with keeping order and preventing the crowd from breaking down the fence. Elsie's tiny white coffin was placed on two brass stands surrounded by lilies of the valley, roses and carnations sent by Mayor Harrison, Judge Sabath, and num numerous city officials. Eight little girls dressed all in white brought out huge sprays of lilies and roses and encircled the stands. Someone brought out two chairs from the Peru back home, set them near the casket, placed a board across them, and used it as a platform to hold the hundreds of flower, floral offerings. Carolina was seated at the head of the cafe while Frank and the other children stood nearby. The Peru backs were not religious, so a simple service was read by Rodolf Jeromir Senka, editor of the Bohemian Chicago Daily Swornost. He spoke of the need to cooperate with the police friend Elsie's killers. As the undertaker went to lift the coffin into the hearse, Carolina backed him to open it so she could see Elsie's face once more, but her relatives persuaded her to let him go about his duties. Most of the attendees followed Elsie's casket to Bohemian National Cemetery, where Senka gave another address. With the funeral over, the police investigation was reinvigorated despite the time that had passed. Police Chief John McLeany woke to devote the entire Chicago police force to finding the killer. Elder Minister Mac asked Governor Deney to increase the reward by another $200 and he announced that he would ask the governor to issue a proclamation calling upon all the people of the state to interest themselves in this case in order that her murderer be apprehended. Coroner Peter Hoffman also started a public reward fund contrib contributing $25 out of his own packet. Investigators soon had a suspect, a man named Joseph Conesti. Described as a bearded bohemian and a hermit paddler, he was said to have frequently enticed little girls to his hut by the drainage canal the same kennel where else his body was discovered. He lived in a shack about a mile and a half from the Peru back home and had been frequently been seen nearby. The owner of the shack that he lived in, Mrs. I'll keep going like it did not happen. <sighs> Mrs. David Shownessy told police that she had complained to Conesty about bringing children around the house and had evicted him on May the 9th. The following day, knowing he was suspected by the police for the murder, he threw himself in front of a train and was killed. Five days later, though, he was cleared of any wrongdoing. On May the 15th, Frank Frubach had information for the investigators. He told detectives that he had spoken to a man he did not know, who told him that he had seen Elsa later in the afternoon of April the 8th on Catsey Avenue, south of the 28th Street, long after she was supposed to have been taken by gypsies. Lieutenant Costello tasked detectives with finding the, the men. A previous sighting of Elsie had her walking toward the canal on South Troy Street, a half block south of her aunt's house. If the unknown was, man was telling the truth, Elsie had been only three blocks away from the bridge. Costello had his own thoughts about the case. He disagreed with the coroner's report and had become convinced that Elsie's death was an accident. She had simply fallen into the canal and died, and if he could prove that she was closer to the canal than was previously thought, it would give more weight to this theory. 
The problem was that Inspector Healy had repeatedly dragged the dishes and candles during the search and her body was not found. In addition, there had been no water in her lungs and she had been molested. Costello was clinging to the initial examination by Dr. Kingston, who told Costello that Elsie had drowned and there were no marks of abuse on her body. He changed his report the following day, but Costello was convinced the first report was accurate. Costello followed his leads, which led nowhere, while other detectives chased suspects of their own. At one point, they surrounded a house near Madison and Ruby Streets and then conducted a house-to-house -house search on the southwest side for a former boarder in the Peru back home. They also looked for the unknown witness who passed on information to Frank and the anonymous letter writer who seemed to know more than he should. Unfortunately, none of these men, like Elsie's killer himself, were ever found. After more than a century, we still don't know what happened to little Elsie Freeback. The same cannot be said for her parents, who were destroyed by their daughter's death. Two years later, on the anniversary of Elsie's funeral in 1913, Frank Peruback died. He was only 45 years old. Carolina lived until December 9, 1927. In death, they have been reunited. All three of them are buried together in Chicago's Bohemian National Cemetery, leaving a haunting mystery. And that's all about this case. And my storage room is full again, so... I will not say anything, but I just want to know one thing. Was Elsie murdered or was her death an accident? Please tell me what you, what you think and have a life full of stars. Till then.